Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Good evening and welcome to the first faculty lecture for the fall 2009 semester. This is the oh, sixth semester we've been doing these faculty lectures and we're getting pretty good turnouts. I'd like to thank all of you for coming to these talks and supporting us. It's been a great opportunity to reach out to the community. Um, I do have down here schedules for the entire semester, a schedule of talks for the entire semester. I will just remind you right now that we have the next talk in three weeks, that's, the, that's September 23rd, when we'll have Dr. Ed Crowther of the History Department talking about Lincoln. The name of his talk is Abraham Lincoln, that is. Lincoln, Race and Slavery. So we have a big variety in our talks this semester. Right now, we're going to have Dr. Rob Benson give us a talk about economic geology in Africa. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rob Benson. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for coming this evening. I really appreciate the turnout. Uh, I'm delighted that I gave the same talk earlier today at noon. And the reason I'm giving two on the same day on the same topic is that different crowds come to each. And I'm thrilled to see that I haven't seen any of you yet today, uh, which is great. And thank you. So, Dr. Estalos, if you could kill the lights, I'd appreciate it. Before we get started here, I need to give you a little bit of background on some things. Uh, this talk is designed to complement some of our summer reading materials. Uh, that's specifically being Long Way Gone, Tale of a Boy's Soldier with Ishmael Bay. And really what this is designed to do is give you a little bit of a feel for some of the things that are related to mining in Africa. You know, why, what are some of the things that are driving and financing some of the uh, various events that are going on? Uh, in case you're wondering, uh, this is indeed a diamond. Uh, this is an example of a mineral called rutile, which is uh, titanium oxide. And this is the very, very famous Kimberley diatreme on Kimberley, Africa. This thing is actually, logically enough, a kimberlite full of water. Uh, we'll talk more about that later on. And this is one of the surface mines going in Sierra Leone. Okay, I have to give you a little bit of background by first of all violating one of the prime rules of PowerPoint presentations. I've just overwhelmed you here with text. Uh, I don't expect you to you know, read this whole thing and you know, understand all of it right away, but I did want to give you the definition of what economic geology actually is. Uh, quite a few people have asked me, you know, economic geology, those don't seem to make any sense at all when you compare them to each other. They're two words that kind of contrast a little bit. Well, really, it's all about ore deposits. If you can take it out of the ground and you can make money on it, we're talking about economic geology here. It's an ore deposit. Now, does that mean that you know, you're going to go out and find an ore deposit and you're going to be rich for the rest of your life? Uh, ore deposits are one of those weird kinds of things. What governs whether or not something is ore? Really, it has to do with market value, because if you're going to take it out of the ground, you've got to sell it for something. It can't cost too much to get it out of the ground. Uh, you can't spend too much time uh, you know, trying to find your product. I mean, you can't spend too much time developing the, material, the infrastructure to get it out of the ground. Uh, there are a lot of different things. There's a lot of risk involved. So you might find an ore deposit today. It might not be an ore deposit tomorrow. Sounds pretty grim, right? Well, actually, uh, in my oh, 12 years or so of being involved with economic geology, uh, it's been a very interesting time. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, but quite honestly, I'm glad I don't do it anymore. OK, so let's talk a little bit about ore deposits in general. This is somewhat simplistic uh, in an overview. I'm going to tell you about some commonalities to all of these different kinds of things. All ore deposits have some kind of a host. Okay, what does that mean? That's the stuff, that's the body that actually hosts the commodity that you're after. I don't care if it's gold. There are different kinds of gold occurrences. You can get vein gold, where it's actually confined in a rock along a quartz vein, perhaps, or as a placer deposit as effectively very, very valuable gravel. There are a lot of different things that can confine those sorts of things. Uh, there's a whole variety of different kinds of uh, places that these things can, that, uh, can host ore deposits. There also has to be a source 
for the fluids. Okay, now I already used the word fluids. Okay, so we have a source. Where do the metals come from? What do they land in? What hosts them after the metals or whatever are deposited? So how do those fluids get there? Well, there has to be some kind of a structure. There has to be some way that materials can get from the source to the host and be deposited. And now, this next one seems kind of silly. You've got to have the right stuff in there. If you're looking for copper and you find gold, that might be okay, but you kind of blew it, right? Uh, you have to be able to find the right kinds of systems. Okay, so we've got these four things. You're going to see them throughout today. Uh, really, really, I mean, you know what? This seems almost simplistic, doesn't it? Well, please, please keep these things in mind. Because in addition to having these four relatively, apparently, on the surface kind of simple concepts, uh, this one is critical. The anomaly. I mean, what is an anomaly? It's something unusual. It's could be, it could be, uh, I don't know, anybody ever get a surprise $50 bill in the mail? Yeah, that, well that's an anomaly because you don't usually find money in your pockets, do you? Unless of course you've been washing your kids' clothes. Uh, so how does that relate to these four things here? Uh, well, pretty much, you can have a host, you can have some particularly favorable rock that's known to host a particular type of ore deposit, great. That could be over a very wide area. Well, there has to be a source somewhere in the area to get to that, to get uh, supply material to that host. Uh, there have to be structures in the area, and there has to be the right stuff in the solutions or in the system. And they all have to coincide in one area, and that's the idea of the anomaly. Something different, something different. Okay, so let's talk about the geologic setting of Africa. This is a very, very simple kind of a statement. It's got a lot of GOEs in it, a lot of geological lingo. Uh, okay, well, I'll kind of translate this a little bit. Metamorphic and granitic rocks. Okay, those, those are rocks that are relatively felsic. Say I'm throwing another word at you. They have a lot of silica in them. And they also have a lot of other materials, iron and magnesium. They're metamorphic. They've been recrystallized quite a bit. Okay, they've been through a few pressure temperature changes. Uh, they're highly deformed. They've been squished, squeezed, squashed, and otherwise messed up. Now, if you ever want to experiment with metamorphism, it's easy to do. Imagine a layer cake in your house. You ever get those, you know, birthday kinds of cakes, yellow cakes with chocolate frosting? Okay, what you need to do to imagine something being highly deformed, push down on it and in on the sides at the same time. What's that going to do to your cake? Are all the components still going to be there? Yep. Yeah, but are things going to be uh, pretty. <laughs> not pretty anymore? They will be... I mean, an entirely different shape. Okay, so this highly deformed metamorphic and granitic rocks package is the bulk of Africa. And it's overlain by a very thin sedimentary veneer, just a little bit of scattered sediment up on top, with a few little basins. Now, one of the things about this area, and you'll see this coming up, is that it's a very, very old set of rocks. It's very old. It's been eroded. It's been exposed to the weather for a long time. And there are a lot of little depositional basins in different places. Okay, so let's look at what some of these major African commodities are. Gold is one of them. That's the one that most people tend to think of. Followed by diamonds. I'm sure you've all, or quite a few of you, have seen a movie called Blood Diamond. Well, like all good Hollywood things, and some of you who have had class with me know that I love to use only good examples of geology from Hollywood, good portrayals, but in all fairness, there's an awful lot of bad geology in Hollywood, too. Blood Diamond is one of those that's kind of, it's got some good stuff in it, but a lot of it is somewhat uh, modified to be better for entertainment. This is one that people may not think of very often in association with Africa. This thing's called PGEs. These are platinum group elements. And there are four of them. And they're all kind of ringed around in the general area of platinum on the periodic table. Things like palladium and iridosmine and uh, iridium, rather, and uh, rhodium. 
Uh, they typically occur together. Titanium is yet another one. People here may have fancy bikes that are made out of titanium or have titanium components. This is one that many of you have had fortune to use. If you own a Land Rover, you have a lot of this stuff. Uh, but, I mean seriously, that's, that's an important thing in a Land Rover, aluminum body. Uh, but this idea of bauxite, this is an aluminum oxide. This is a little bit different than some of these guys up here, and you'll see that coming up. Uh, these are typically the kinds of deposits that are uh, very, very uh, concentrated through surface processes. And then we have chrome, and also uranium. Now this is by, f th there are a lot of other metals that Africa has that are very, very important. Now, some of these metals are actually relatively rare. The only other country that has a significant amount of titanium so far uh, is Russia. And many, many years ago, it was kind of ironic that all the titanium uh, that went into some U.S. spy planes actually came from Russia. And so it kind of illustrates how economics were kind of getting around the Cold War because uh, Lockheed was getting a lot of their titanium, Lockheed's contractors were getting a lot of their titanium sponge from Russia. And of course that was returned to Russia at high altitude at different times uh, as they flew around. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, South Africa in particular has been, been very interesting to the world is because of the, the value of these uh, relatively rare metals. So how do you find all these guys? How do you find all these uh, various kinds of very, very important metals and commodities? Uh, the key thing, and I'll talk about this in a little more detail after I go over some of the deposit types, is understanding the age, knowing the age of the rocks. Now that seems kind of silly, doesn't it? I mean, you, gold is where you find it. Uh, who cares what the age of the rocks is? Well, if you're trying to find this stuff, and you're looking for similar age materials, that might give you a clue as to where you might find the good stuff. So first, let's talk about gold and these ancient plaster deposits. Well, we'll talk about those in a minute, and I'm going to give you an overview of what these deposit types are. Uh, diamonds in Africa typically occur in things called kimberlites. The platinum group crowd and also titanium and chrome typically occur in something called a layered mafic intrusion. For those of you who are taking notes, they're called LMIs. And then the bauxite and uranium crowd typically occur in these oxidized deposits. Now I'll be going through each one of these to give you a general overview of how they occur. And then you'll get a feel for why they're particularly common in Africa. So first, let's talk about the uh, placers. <coughs> placers have been around for a long time. Uh, in fact, this particular drawing of placers, uh, this came out of a book by a guy named uh, Gregorius de Agricola, uh, who wrote a book called De Re Metallica in the 1400s. Uh, this is one of his illustrations. Uh, obviously, gold mining was discovered before perspective. I mean, look at these guys. Uh, however, all the techniques are still very, very valid. If I get in your way, Lee, just holler at me, okay? Uh, they're using their winnowing out gravel in different places. This guy is hacking out the bank, trying to get uh, material to flow down into the stream to be recovered down in this area. Uh, this is an example of a sluice box over here. And believe it or not, people are still using these techniques today. They still work. Because the basic concept underlying placer gold deposits is this idea of fluvial concentration. Great, it's water. That's all it is. Uh, if you tell somebody today that you're going panning for gold, uh, th there's a good chance they'll know what you're talking about because we've seen a lot of it in the literature. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Jack London and all of his wonderful Alaska Gold Rush stories, they talk about panning gold all the time. Uh, the thing that's particularly interesting is that Yes, there are a lot of rivers in different places, different parts of the world. Uh, and what happens 
when rivers cross rock? Down. Where's it down? It produces sediments. And gold is heavier than most all things. And so it tends to drop out of solution, out of being carried by the streams, uh, a lot quicker than a lot of other materials. It tends to get concentrated in little areas where there have been velocity drops in the movement of the water. So what could that be? Well, what are these guys doing right here? They stuck a little bar, a barrier across the, uh, the stream. And what happens when the stream goes over the top of this little barrier? It slows down a little bit right here. It gets a little more turbulent and material will get dropped. Heavier materials will get dropped right behind this dam. If you've ever been out at the sand dunes and have seen where the water flows across and makes ripples uh, very close to the parking lot there, uh, you may have seen a lot of black sands down in the lower parts of the ripples. That's a very dense material called magnetite and it's being concentrated down low. Now, there's no gold out there to speak of, but it's the same general kind of process. Now, as far as the rest of the description here goes, under different atmospheric conditions, back when all of these African rocks were being deposited and moved and so forth, uh, there was a lot less oxygen around, a lot less. And what did that do? Uh, why is that significant? Well, it didn't really affect how water behaved. I mean, water flows downhill now, just like it did way back then, in all likelihood. Uh, the thing is, is that stuff that was, different stuff was stable in water. And that different stuff that I'm speaking of is uranium. Clumps of uranium oxides tended to stay in solution a lot longer uh, and be concentrated right along with the gold. Now, these are ancient placers. They're often buried in the bedrock. Uh, and so they're often mined in Africa underground. And this is what the Vidvatersrand ones are in South Africa. Uh, very, very, very different kinds of things. Okay, what's suspicious about this one? These are clumps of gravel. They're out here. What's all in between all the big pieces? This is indeed gold. Pretty high concentration of gold, huh? Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that you will, may find in parts of Africa as far as these ancient placer deposits go. So they got, um, stuck together? Well, they've been lithified after being deposited. Uh, essentially, they, the whole thing got glued together. Uh, and this is a sign of an ancient deposit. They still find placer gold on the surface, but the more famous gold deposits that uh, 20 years ago were producing 85% uh, of the world's production uh, are, are down, down south. Yeah. Okay, these are obviously diamonds. Uh, they're very, very pretty diamonds uh, for the most part. These are pretty much fresh out of the ground. These are not processed. They haven't been to a jewelry store or any of that stuff. Uh, they're the kind of diamonds I like. Uh, because they're in their natural state and they show the crystal habit really well. But they are related to these things called kimberlites. Okay, so what's a kimberlite? Uh, they're a very, very unusual style of volcanic eruption. Okay, now what's significant about the deep crustal conditions part? Diamonds are horribly unstable. If any of you have a diamond, it's dying to turn into carbon. Now, they are carbon by composition, but they are in a special form, tightly bonded, uh, that reflects high pressure and temperature conditions when they form. Uh, the problem is they're so well stuck together that if you provide them with a little bit of extra energy, they will happily turn into graphite, which some of you may be using or attempting to use to take notes with. Uh, and graphite in itself, I mean, you can buy a lot of that down at Walmart. The amount of graphite that you might go through in a year might be enough to produce one of these diamonds. Uh, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of carbon. The problem with these guys is that uh, in geologic terms, in geologic time, uh, if they very slowly were brought up from very, very deep, high pressure, high temperature conditions, they probably would change into something that's graphite-like. Uh, so how do we find them at the surface? Well, these darn diatremes are rapid enough that they bring them up to the surface before they can change into something else. 
So here's a general model, and we'll look at another one uh, that has a little more detail in a moment. Uh, this is very typical of what diatremes look like in cross-section. Uh, and what's very interesting about them is that, you know, here's the feeder dike down here. What's this one? What would you call this in terms of the little diagram in the upper right? So a feeder dike would be a? Well, it's also a structure. The source might be down in this area. Uh, and again, you raise a good point. Uh, you know, sometimes structures and sources are a little bit blended. And we'll see a better example of source laid out here in a moment. And there are all kinds of structures and broken stuff here where things expanded and blew upwards and there was indeed a kind of volcanic eruption up in this area. And very often, uh, these things will subside a little bit and a large lake or pond will be left behind and material will fall inwards. Now what's interesting about these is that the best way to find them is that you don't look for, I mean, if you find a kimberlite, if you find the rock, uh, it's almost like, yeah, you're already on your target. What kinds of things can you look at that might bring you into the area to you know, look more closely to find kimberlites? Uh, really, one of the best things to do is look for topographic lows, areas of little lower pockets, little sedimentary basins that are somewhat circular. <laughs> now, people have often asked, you know, how big are these things? I mean, is this 10 miles across? Is it 20 feet across? Uh, well, the correct geological answer is, well, it depends, uh, which is kind of a cop-out. But there is a diatreme which uh, is nearby, which has been very, very deeply eroded. Most of the stuff has been weather weathered away from the sides, and now you can see that essentially the guts of the whole diatreme. And that is shiprock, believe it or not. Shiprock at one time was thought to have been a volcano. And it's eroded down to the point where we can see the roots of the volcano and the dikes and the volcanic neck and stuff. But some people in the last uh, 10 years or so ago uh, or so have actually looked at the neck in a little more detail and discovered that it had a lot of uh, these gas-rich fluid kind of eruptions that are so characteristic of diatremes. Now, I can't tell you if they found any diamonds out there. I don't know. Uh, just because you have a uh, diatreme or a kimberlite doesn't automatically mean that uh, you've got diamonds in it, but the potential is there. So let's look at some that are a little, uh, a little better studied. This one has a little bit more information on it that illustrates non-diamond pipes versus diamond pipes. Uh, okay, where's the source now? Is it a little more clear? Down in this area. Here are structures. Here's the host area up, up in here. And the right stuff, of course being the diamonds, uh, are coming from down here. Now, this line that goes right through here, this sort of a contour line, it represents uh, conditions that define whether something's going to be diamond or graphite. So if a diamond's living down in this area and is slowly transported upwards toward the, toward the surface a little bit, uh, it will cross into an area of conditions where graphite is stable and diamonds aren't. So what happens? The diamond turns into graphite. So theoretically, if this area got buried and put under a lot more pressure and higher temperature, it would go the other way. It would go from graphite into diamond. So how do we get these things up here? Well, in this case, you know, there's some gas and vents and so forth and a little bit of heat pushing up through here. And we'll talk more about these heat sources in a moment. Uh, essentially, this stuff vented up to the surface and carried diamonds with it, focused in these pipes. Now, how, you know, why, why is this particular heat source right here? Well, from a plate tectonic point of view, this is what's called a divergent boundary. Imagine a line going straight up through the middle of this slide. The material on the left is being pulled to the left, the material on the right is being pulled to the right. What does that do in this area? It stretches the crust just a little bit, fractures form, and provides a great venue or avenue for these things to shoot on out. Now, of course, these are somewhat these are somewhat uh, stylized for illustration, but uh, this is kind of the key thing right here. Some of the real examples, and now the diagram on the left is a composite diagram of several different uh, kimberlite styles of deposits. Um, in North America, things are a little bit more complicated, but they all have the common feature of a feeder zone bringing diamonds up and then a place where they erupted on the surface. Now, 
what this diagram is showing is that there's one group called the Manville Group in part of Canada that has this style of kimberlite diamond deposit fairly close to the surface. We actually have ones in Colorado which are at a higher level and they have a different character of diamond. Uh, if you're familiar with where Gateway, Colorado is, or Northgate, not, not Gateway uh, over on the west side, but Northgate, uh, practically in Wyoming, there are a series of diamond pipes up there. Now, do they have any diamonds in them? Yeah, they do. Are they really good quality diamonds? Uh, no. If uh, you've seen the movie Beautiful Girls, you may remember a scene where a guy was, he was going to get the girl and he bought her a brown diamond. And his, his friends were just astonished. He said, you bought her a brown rock? Uh, he said, yeah, man, it's champagne. It's the latest rage. Well, those are the ones that come out of the Colorado diet streams, these sort of champagne brown diamonds. I think they're cool, but uh, I don't know. Maybe they weren't designed for that particular purpose. Uh, however, in Africa, things are a little more simple, which is always a good thing geologically. Typically, long pipes that carry fairly high-grade diamonds up to the top. And they are fairly restricted. And in, that, in the title slide, we saw the Kimberly diamond pipe over in the lower right, or lower left, excuse me. Uh, they mined right down the pipe. And that's why it has that very tube-like appearance. OK, we'll move on now to the, PG, the LMIs, the Platinum Group guys. Uh, the first thing you might notice about the picture is it has beautiful, beautiful layers. These particular elements, uh, the PGEs and the titanium and the chrome, uh, are generally associated with very, very low silica kinds of intrusions. Uh, what does that mean in a practical sense? They flow easily. They're very, very fluid. So typically, what happens when layered mafic intrusions are able to form they kind of squeeze into an area and form a big underground chamber. And as things begin to crystallize, uh, where do you think the heavy guys go when they crystallize in this molten fluid? Where do they go? Where do the heavy guys go? Down. They sink down. They start accumulating on the bottom. Where do the light guys go? Up. Now, logically enough, things like chrome, believe it or not, uh, is often a very dark mineral. Uh, chrome in a mineral is typically uh, gives it a dark color. Magnetite, uh, uh, rutile, a whole number of different ones are all typically dark colored and they sink. I know it seems like counterintuitive that something light like titanium would be in a mineral that would be relatively heavy, but that's the way it works out. Uh, and then all the light guys, the silica rich things tend to go up. So we have a nice layering going on. This is the good stuff right here. This is nice and easy to mine. Do you see why? Well, it's, you could tell if you had a miner who went out there and knew nothing about ore deposits, you could tell them, just take the dark stuff. <laughs> it's like mining by the colors. It's very nice. So to look at a, a model of how these things might actually form, uh, here's the source right down through here. Where's the host? Well, it could be this whole rock area that may be uh, slightly inclined to allow these big kinds of intrusions and trap them in places. Uh, so what's happening in a process sort of a sense? Materials coming up through here. This is fairly homogeneous material. It's got all the components. You know, it's got all sorts of metals and everything in it. That's the sort. Well, that's the the structure that's bringing stuff up. There's plenty of stuff in the solution. Uh, in this case, it's magma. And then as it starts to cool over here, yeah, the heavy sink, the lights float, no problem. And so theoretically, after a little while, you would get a nice big light band through here, meeting a big dark band on the bottom, right? Well, is that, is that what this looks like up here? This looks more like an Oreo cookie, a repeating Oreo cookie. Uh, OK, well, why is that? Well, it's not just this nice, happy little settling going on, or happy floating here. But over on this side, things are getting built up. And what happens every once in a while? They fail fall downhill. And so you can get all kinds of different things happening. Sometimes little bridges of sorts or layers get built up in here uh, where the dark guys settle and get stuck for a little bit. And then underneath, the light guys float up and get slammed against the bottom of whatever that layer might be. Uh, this happens quite commonly in lakes, uh, boundaries between colder water and hot water, hotter water. Uh, 
So these are very interesting animals. So let's move on to the oxide ones, the ones that are up on the surface, uranium and aluminum. This is kind of an interesting combination of things. Now remember what I said about Africa having a lot of erosion up on top, a lot of stuff coming down? This next comment is also going to apply to gold deposits because it works well in talking about these. Have you ever heard the old story about, oh, I found a big gold deposit, I'm going to go upstream and find the mother load? You ever heard that? I mean, that's, that's mining legend. The problem is, is that fluvial processes, these chemical processes, tend to concentrate things. So what does that mean? Well, you might be in a narrow little drainage, you might find yourself a major pocket of stuff. Are you going to go upstream and find the one source, the mother load? You might, but the chances are good that you're not. Because it might encompass a whole huge basin with very, very low gold or low aluminum or low uranium scattered all through it. And as that stuff erodes down into a drainage, it gets concentrated down there. So it's almost like, oh, all the fluvial processes and stuff are what's making all your material economic. It's like the kinds of things that can actually help, uh, help you make money. So how does this happen with bauxite? Well, a lot of minerals have a lot of aluminum in them. Uh, it's one of the more common elements in the Earth's crust. Now, does that mean that beer cans are made out of some sand deposit that somebody found that has a lot of feldspar in it? Yeah, you could make aluminum out of that stuff, but it'd be, it would be prohibitively expensive. So what happens uh, in a lot of tropical types of deposits, and I emphasize tropical because in the tropics you get a lot of rain. Uh, of course, in places of Alaska you get a lot of rain too, but uh, in those typical sorts of scenarios where there's a lot of rock and a lot of water coming through, there's tremendous soil development going on. This could be 60, 70, 80, 100 feet thick. Uh, so as water is working its way through here, as it's picking up uh, more acidic character, both from uh, carbon dioxide and also whatever humus it might be going through, uh, it tends to dissolve things out. And where do those things go? Down. And they get precipitated down here. They get concentrated downwards. So really, if you think about it, uh, this thing's helping out with concentrating ore, this natural process. Typically, what's left behind up here are the aluminums. They don't dissolve out. So, over a long period of geologic time, what happens? Metals might get brought down here, aluminum gets left behind up in here. Uh, what's nice about all the aluminum being up here? Easy to get. You're darn right, it's easy to get to. You can go out there with a scraper and just load it up and ship it to uh, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Oh, the Pacific Northwest is where a lot of aluminum gets processed. Uh, not because the aluminum deposits are there, it's just that electricity is cheap. Uh, refining aluminum is a very electricity intensive process. Uh, and they have lots of dams. Uh, of course, recycled aluminum takes about a sixth of the energy. And that's becoming an increasingly large component of aluminum work these days, which is good. Uh, now, these metals over in here, are less important uh, in terms of what they are. What's really important is notice how they behave in terms of concentration going down. These are parts per million and nickel is fairly, fairly low up at the very top. It's been leached out and concentrated downwards. Look at the values down in here. Relatively high. From less than 0.8 up to 1.5 to 4. That's a significant concentration change. And then going further down, see how it changes again? Fresh rock doesn't have nearly as much nickel in it. Look at the cobalt and the iron and the magnes uh, magnesium oxide. Same sort of behavior, all the way down. So you can just imagine a process of things being concentrated downwards uh, through erosion. Now does that mean that these rocks uh, are all rich everywhere? Well, they have typically you know, trace amounts of all those elements I was talking about, but they tend to get concentrated downwards by these nice erosional processes. These are extraction processes uh, in terms of the ones that work best for actually processing the ores. Uh, I won't talk about those. What I will talk about is another cool animal. Uh, and this is a uranium style of a deposit inside of an aquifer. We actually have some of these locally. Uh, these style of deposits occur uh, along the western slope near a town called Nukla. 
and down towards Gateway, Colorado, uh, and further south, all the way down into uh, New Mexico. Okay, as far as the geologic setting of this particular package goes, uh, siltstone and shale up here, or shale up here. Uh, the key thing there is that water doesn't go through this stuff very easily. Underlying siltstone or shale, water doesn't go through very easily there either. Everything in here is a sandstone containing trace amounts of uranium. Okay, well some areas of this, the red ones in particular, uh, have very, very high grade uranium. Uh, okay, so what's going on out here? Trace amounts of uranium, trace amounts of uranium. There's virtually no uranium where it's yellow. Uh, so all the uranium in this yellow area has gotten concentrated down into the red areas by water flowing through, groundwater flowing through. If you had a, uh, a well and you sank it through here, drilled it through here, uh, yeah, you'd get groundwater. Uh, would you want to use that in your house? I mean, uranium salts are good for some things, but not for consumption. They're pretty poisonous. Uh, if you drilled over here, what might happen? You might get a little bit of uranium, but if you start pumping a lot of water out, it might pull this stuff into your well and then up. Uh, and so then you just delay the problem. But what's nice about these things is that the uranium is all concentrated. Now, if you doubt how concentrated this stuff can, uh, can, can be, there are some occurrences of these things uh, where people would go in and mine them and die of radiation sickness not too much later. There's a crater in Africa called the Nagoro Crater, which actually shows evidence of having gone critical and a natural fission reaction occurred a million or so years ago, long before any atomic device was detonated. Uh, so that's kind, of, that's kind of unnerving to think that these things might actually go critical on us. Uh, but anyway, this is one of the things that uh, Africa has. So why is it unique in terms of all these ore deposits? Why is Africa so unusual? All the things that I've talked about so far, all the deposit types I've mentioned, are not necessarily related directly to Africa. It's not like if you think kimberlite, they're only in Africa. I mentioned some in Colorado. Same thing with the uranium ones, also in Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, the key thing is, is that much of Africa's rock is very old. I'm talking 100 mil, 1,000 million years here, a billion years. A lot of years have gone by after a lot of Africa's rock was formed. This is the crux right here. Early in the Earth's history, when it was a molten ball and this thin little skin of material was starting to form, early, early crust, the Earth had not differentiated very much. Okay, so if the Earth is totally molten, where's the heavy stuff going to go? To the center. If the crust solidifies a little bit, it captures some of those heavy elements before they can get away. So, this is Africa, through my favorite reconnaissance tool, Google Earth. The physical geology guys get to tour uh, parts of the world looking at geological features tomorrow in the lab. It's quite fun. So when I mentioned ages earlier, uh, the ages that are really important, there are two of them. The first one is this time period. This is in the Precambrian. And you can see what the bracket is. I mean, that's what, 30, 37? 3.7 billion years up to about 1.6 billion years. That's an old chunk of rock. The plate tectonics hadn't really even gotten going very much by this time. Uh, the Earth was very hot uh, at this time, very little oxygen. There were oceans at the time, but they weren't exactly good for swimming. Uh, very little life is evident in the fossil record. It wasn't up until uh, the beginning of the Paleozoic that the fossil record started becoming uh, abundant, although there are uh, very, very old bacteria fossils found down in here in that age. So think about that. Okay, that's the crust forming in Africa. In the Mesozoic, when there was a lot of breakage going on, when the, a lot of the continents were being pulled apart, when they were formed in a supercontinent called Pangaea, uh, there was a lot of breaking going on. Okay, what does breaking do? Structure. Provides some structures. Okay, so here's kind of a good cartoon about uh, how the Earth formed. And they talk about a rocky body. Uh, they didn't even call it Earth. But anyway, you are here. Uh, 
This is early, early on. Okay, so what happened between here and here? Uh, this is like not too far after the Big Bang kinds of stuff. Uh, the Earth is reasonably solid at this point. You can see that it's somewhat molten in the middle. But as it got a little bit bigger, as more and more stuff coalesced, it hit a, hit a point where, yeah, it was indeed molten. And then, what's going on here in this picture? See all those little streaks of things going in and out? Well, the heavy stuff is starting to sink to the middle, and the light stuff is starting to move to, to the outer part. Uh, and this is a nice generalized concept of a differentiated Earth. This is what it looks like now, we believe. The purpose of this is to give you a better feel for what the overall structure of the Earth is at this time. Uh, all these plates out here represent the crust. We have a couple different styles of crust through here. But this crust is relatively young. The African crust formed way back before most of this stuff formed, and it got a disproportionate share, as did most very, very old rocks around the world. Uh, it got a disproportionate share of unusual metals. The inner core is solid iron with a fair amount of nickel in it. The outer core is liquid iron. That seems somewhat contradictory. You would expect the inner to be liquid and the outer core to be solid. Uh, the reason for that ha is it's due to pressure and phase stabilities of, uh, of iron. This area of mantle, upper mantle and lower mantle, is a very, very plastic, ductile kind of material. And what's going on with these things? This is material that's being pushed down. There's melting going on here. Stuff's moving around. Uh, all sorts of little mantle plumes. Think of these things as being heat sources. Okay, did anybody follow what was going on with Yellowstone last year? Of course, all the government conspirists were all saying things like, the government's not telling us we're about to be destroyed. Uh, well, they had, they had reason to be a little bit concerned. There was a little bit more earthquake activity. Yellowstone sits on top of a hot spot, probably a mantle plume right underneath it. Uh, so, I mean, that could could possibly happen. Uh, from a geological point of view, it could happen any minute. That's a geologic minute, uh, which means it could happen any time in the next, you know, 500,000 years. Another way to look at this is, here's the general Earth right here, relatively molten at this point, and iron drops are descending in. Iron is accumulating in the center, and the lighter material is floating to the outside. In the diagram below, you can see the lighter material moving out, and the black dots would represent uh, heavier materials going in. So right about the time things start segregating in the lower diagram, uh, you can just imagine this crust having formed up here and captured a lot of these dark things before it gets down too far. Here's where all that cool stuff is. Now, if you look at the dark colored material, the brown, dark brown rock, that represents all the exposed Precambrian material. Whereas light brown, that represents Precambrian material, very old stuff down in this area, that is just covered up by a thin sedimentary veneer or something like that. Now, if you look at the home base perspective, we're right about here. We're right in the middle of this thing called an orogenic belt immediately to the uh, to the uh, west of us. And that's why if you're interested in geology, as soon as you leave the Front Range and head for Chicago, life becomes very boring. Because you're on the craton over here. You're on all that sedimentary rock that, you know, from an oil point of view is great, but from a road cut point of view is awful. Uh, look at Africa. Africa is almost entirely Precambrian rock. Australia also has a lot of Precambrian rock. See all these little wiggly belts through here? These represent places where continents are either actively moving and colliding with other plates, like along the west coast. And look at this area through here, where the Eurasian plate and Africa are being pushed together a little bit. This is where the biggest collision origin known in the world is. Uh, that's why Mount Everest and K2 reside there. Uh, and this particular orogenic belt and through here uh, has had all sorts of interesting activity with uh, pretty severe fatality results. Uh, this is where that huge tsunami occurred the day after Christmas in 2006. Uh, because of the, all the earthquake stuff going on there. 
Okay, so when did this area actually get pulled apart and pushed back together again? That was the Mesozoic that I was mentioning earlier. Now, one of the problems with looking at very, very old rocks is that most of the oceanic crust is only about 180 million years old because it's been recycled so many times. So that leaves about 25% of the Earth's crust relatively I mean, that's, that's, that's our only record left of what was going on a long time ago. So we're kind of limited in what we can infer. This continent called Rodinia was around about a billion or so years ago. Uh, here's another one that was believed to have occurred a little bit later, 550 million years ago. Uh, but the key thing here is, is that Africa you know, represents some of these pieces through here. Here's Africa is kind of stitched together a little bit more. Uh, but all that crust is there. I mean, that's the stuff that was around. Now, this is a clear, obvious geologic map of Africa that tells the whole story, right? This is exhibit two of what not to show in a PowerPoint. This is impossible, isn't it? But fortunately, we have a really cool tool called GIS. Uh, this shows it with a little more clarity. Uh, all those different colors, each color represents a distinct rock type. Uh, Fortunately, all those rock types have a distinct age, and it's possible to sort those out and create a better presentation. Uh, the dark brown material represents Precambrian stuff. Okay, so if you just had to go out there and start cruising around Africa, and you knew you had the key information that uh, things like layered mafic intrusions with platinum group elements uh, were in old rocks, you already know where to look. You're not just going to stroll around the whole continent at this point, are you? You already know that you're only going to waste your time looking in, uh, you're not going to waste your time looking in the gray areas. You're going to look in stuff that's more, it's got a greater density of uh, Precambrian rock. Now, as a standard joke that goes along amongst geologists, it's not just figuring out where to look, it's figuring out where to look where no one else has looked. It's like hunting elk, you know? You don't go into a, a place that's full of elk where everybody's been shooting at them for the last week. Uh, that doesn't work very well. So, looking back again at one of my favorite uh, reconnaissance tools, this one has some extra information on it. These are kimberlite pipes. Notice how they have kind of a linear arrangement to them, and they're clustered in some parts. What is that relating to? In order for a kimberlite to form, what has to happen? There's a hot spot, there has to be some structures, there has to be some reason why those things would shoot quickly to the surface. And, sure enough, this is why South Africa has lots of diamonds, they have lots of kimberlites. Now, does that mean that every one of these little purple dots has diamonds associated with it? No. No, I mean, they can, there can be a variety of different kinds. If some came up slower than others, they may not have diamonds uh, that are as big. Uh, if some didn't tap into a source area that was as good, they may not be as many. Uh, it could be a variety of different things. If they're in Colorado, they tapped into a brown diamond source area. Uh, but now let's start focusing in on you know, one of the important things about the summer reading stuff. Where's Sierra Leone? It's right over here. Tiny little country. Notice that there's some little purple dots right up in here that represent where some of those diamond pipes are at. So Sierra Leone specifically has a lot of the kinds of things that uh, the rest of Africa has. It's got diamonds, it's got gold, it's got rutile, which is a titanium oxide related to layered mafic intrusions. Uh, it's got a fair amount of bauxite and it has a fair amount of platinum. So look at the size of Sierra Leone compared to the rest of Africa. Ghana has a huge amount of stuff associated with it. Burkina Faso also has a huge amount of mineral wealth. Sierra Leone does also. Now this doesn't help too much. Uh, this has the major roads and so forth on here, as they are. But there are a fair amount of rivers that connect these major cities going through here. Okay, what are rivers good for? They erode material, they might have some gold in them and so forth, particularly if they're concentrating materials out of here. All those kimberlite pipes are located down in this part of the country where the diamonds are at. Uh, this whole area 
is underlain by Precambrian rock, uh, fairly rich in aluminum and lots of various kinds of platinum sorts of things. Uh, but there's something noticeably absent about this particular map. Yeah, it's Google Earth and it's, you know, cool stuff to look at, but compare it to the geologic map of Africa that you saw a minute ago. This has cool satellite photos. Does it have any geology on it? There has not been any significant mining or exploration activity in Sierra Leone since 2000. And it was kind of rough going in the mid 1900s, uh, 1900s and 1990s. Uh, a lot of the major mining companies pulled out of there because they couldn't afford to work there anymore. Just to give you an example of how rough it was getting in Africa at times, uh, I, I worked for a mining company for a number of years and after I got laid off, within a couple of months, a guy wanted me to go over there and do some work. And, you know, I would have gotten a six-digit salary, but I would have been working over there. I wanted to spend time back in this country. I didn't want to do that stuff overseas. And it's a good thing I didn't want to because I might have been shot because a couple of geologists were killed over there about the middle of, about six months after uh, I heard about that. So it got to be rough going. Now, if you're leading a rebellion, if you're a member of the RUF, if you're a general, if you're the chief accountant for the RU RUF, uh, the Revolutionary Front guys, uh, how are you going to finance buying all your ammunition and guns? Yeah, whatever natural resource you can get your hands on. What's nice about diamonds? Small. And they're light, and they're fairly compact. Uh, they're relatively easy to find if you have a lot of guys. I mean, think about this. You know, if you have a lot of people out there panning gold and digging, digging around and trying to find stuff, they might be finding a lot of diamonds, too. And, of course, gold is worth a lot as well. Uh, there's a big movement afoot right now to get pedigrees put on diamonds to make sure they don't come from uh, illicit sources, illegal sources. Uh, you know what they're doing? They're actually microscopically laser engraving diamonds. So, you know, if any of you have a, a very large carat diamond and it's been pedigreed or verified, you won't see a flaw or a mark on it. But under certain magnification, you will uh, actually be able to read that, you know, it's a certified diamond, whatever, whatever. Uh, free trade diamond, I guess. Uh, okay, well, great. You know, uh, what, why, why, is this, why is this important? Well, Sierra, Sierra Leone will probably not have significant stability until this underlying mineral resource throughout this area is the kind of, it becomes a little more available to the country as a whole. Because there's something else that's got a, there's a huge cost that's happening to this country. There's still production coming out of there. I already mentioned diamonds, uh, essentially being used to finance uh, rebel activity, along with gold and a few other things. Uh, do these guys care about environmental impact statements? Absolutely not. Now, think about the gold association that I mentioned earlier and some of these older placer deposits where they're actually mining stuff out. What's the gold associated with? What's that yellowish looking stuff? Not the gold, but the stuff that was in between associated with? The, there's a little bit of uranium. Uranium oxides with those things. Okay, that's not a big deal, right? It gets into the water, it goes downstream, no problem. A few cows die, a few people die, who cares? Got your gold, got your uranium, uh, if, you're, if that's important to you. So most of the mining production coming out of here is called artisanal mining, artisan mining. Uh, I had an interesting discussion with Neil and Elise Rudolph earlier, who in their Peace Corps days actually spent time in this part of the world. And when the British were still uh, fairly well in control and cooperatively mining, and even back then, uh, the British mining procedure was to strip an area out, get the diamonds off some of the kimberlite, the relic kimberlites that were there, and then it would cover it up again at night with a layer of dirt. And then at nighttime, you know what would happen? All the locals would come out and dig down to the kimberlites and try and pull out as many diamonds as they could before daylight arose. And it's kind of an interesting economy story because, uh, you know, it's illegal for those guys to be doing that, but, you know, the sentries would get paid off by the illegal miners. Uh, you know, there's all this huge complex, this big economic web of 
how things were going and everybody was happy. To look at the relief of Sierra Leone, uh, it's fairly flat. There's not a lot going on. The only significantly high mountains are way off in the distance here on the border. So think about all these little pockets, all these little basins you might see in little areas where rivers flow through and so forth. They're relatively isolated, but this is where some of the economic potential for finding more, uh, more mineral wealth could lie. Now, are you just going to land on the Turtle Islands or up in Free, Freetown up here and just drive in and start mining? No, you're not. Uh, this country has uh, huge potential, but look at its mineral wealth. Look how it's getting distributed. Look at the strife that's undergoing right now. And just to end up here, talking about things before I take questions, uh, here are some good samples of what these various kinds of commodities look like. This is bauxite up in here. This is a somewhat boring looking metal or mineral specimen, but uh, it's very, very rich in aluminum. This yellowish kind of bladed mineral through here is rutile. That's uh, very, very rich in titanium. The yellowish material in the matrix of the specimen in the upper right is uraninite. Uh, that's a pretty hot specimen. Uh, we have specimens similar to that in our museum. Uh, you have to ask permission to see them. It'd be taken into a special room, uh, right, Lee? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we put a cinolometer on some of ours and it makes a lot of racket. Uh, this is a platinum nugget through here. This is about an inch across. Uh, this is a penetration twin of a diamond. You can almost see two diamond forms that have kind of grown through each other a little bit. And then my favorite right here in the middle, uh, gold specimens. These are gold specimens that came out of rock. Uh, they have not been transported very far in a river setting because they still have a lot of good crystal form. This one has not been transported at all. Uh, so they're very, very pretty sorts of things. Now, thinking about the, the idea of looking in the right age rocks for certain commodities. We know about Africa right now. Where are we going to look for other deposits in the world, do you think? Is it possible with the information that we have about Africa right now? Sure. Okay, Lisa, give me a, tell me where. Okay, so look for other Archean rocks. Now, I just mentioned that Sierra Leone has lots of potential and has some known mineral occurrences. Uh, Yeah, I mean, you know, trying to open a mine in California is one thing. Trying to open it up when people have AK-47s pointing at you is another thing. Uh, entirely. Where is there geology similar to Sierra Leone in another part of the world? Well, how about South America? Because if you think about it, once upon a time, South America and Africa were kind of nested together tectonically. And now they're pulled apart. And from an historical point of view, what are the Spaniards known for? when they met a group called the Incas and Pizarro and all those guys. Uh, they were very happy to steal all the Inca gold. Where did the Incas get that gold from? Africa. Well, not really Africa per se, but I mean they found equivalent deposits in much of South America. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, our understanding of the value of metal has really changed a lot because when Spaniards found Platinum nuggets in the streams, they thought it was gold that hadn't ripened yet. So what did they do to it? They threw it back. What a deal, huh? Uh, and there have been people who have actually gone and looked for areas of Spanish activity, mining activity, and have looked downstream for where all that activity was for specifically platinum. Isn't that wild? Uh, okay, uh, I would like to go ahead and have Dr. Stalos turn on some of the lights anyhow. And I'll be happy at this point to take any questions. Did you guys all wake up over there? Sorry about that. I wish we could just ramp the lights up slowly. Um, yes, ma'am. When I read the New York Times about the fighting in Eastern Africa, the Congo and so on, mm -hmm. there are references to the fact that some of the factions there are financing themselves with minerals and mm -hmm. so on. So I mean, what, what would be the minerals over there that they're... Mining and, and marketing. They'll have a lot of similar things uh, to what I talked 
to you about already. However, somebody asked me a question earlier about the specific uh, metals that were being uh, mined in the Congo area or were abundant in the Congo area. I did not have the answer at that point, and I uh, threw the question out to anybody else who might know, and I ended up going and looking. Uh, it's lithium. Oh, it's lithium. Lithium. Yeah. So maybe that's why some people are going psycho. They're not taking enough of the product. Uh, but there's, there are lithium localities not very far away from us. Anybody ever seen that really pink stuff from a place, place called Harding, New Mexico? There's a wonderful pink mica. Uh, if any of you come by our museum, we have little handouts of it. Uh, it's beautiful pink stuff. It looks like biotite, only it's pink. Biotite being a black mica. And that's one of the common things they have there in, con in, in the Congo. Congo. Yeah. It seems to be very profitable because the, the different groups are yeah. marketing it with yeah. international assistance. Does anybody know what the price of gold is today, by the way? 960. Yeah. Yeah. I knew a business guy was here. That'd be, that was great. <laughs> Yesterday it was how much? Uh, yeah, <laughs> there we go. Did you buy some today? Good for you. <laughs> uh, what's platinum? Uh, Palladium's a lot more expensive. Well, yeah, it's a little, it's harder to separate it out. Okay, what else? Because you guys have a writing assignment, don't you? Or were you just? Yeah, they have a nice professor that told them they just needed to come and learn. They could learn. Okay, I'll give you my notes and you can quiz them later then. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from you guys? Was that a hand coming up, or just a scratch? <laughs> It's like being at an auction. How you get your friend in trouble when they're calling, you kick them and they go, huh! <laughs> yes, Con? Is that uh, lithium going to be a factor in the production of batteries? Mm hmm Anybody here have a cell phone? You have lithium on you right now. Isn't that great? Lithium batteries are better anyway. They don't have that charge cycling problem that a lot of the NICAD batteries do. Nickel cadmium. What else, folks? Yes, Lee? What kind of other minerals would you find with platinum or gold? Ooh, there's a bunch of them. Uh, you don't, don't ask the main ones. Uh, chromite is, is a big one. Uh, there are a number of platinum sulfides, like belangerite. Uh, uh, they're, for the most part, fairly dark minerals. Uh, magnetite very often has chrome in with it, uh, because chromite and magnetite are structurally very similar. Uh, and by the way, the platinum group guys are right here. 45, 46, 77, and 78. And notice that nickel is very close by, cobalt's close by, iron's over here, copper's over here. Uh, so you don't have to know much about the periodic table, but the fact that they're all parked fairly close to each other suggests that they do behave in a similar fashion. That's just a scratch over there, right? Yes, sir? What kind of minerals would you expect to find like here in the San Luis Valley and in what are you looking for? <laughs> gold. Gold? Well, gold itself doesn't form very many minerals uh, that stand alone. But typically what we look for is gold geologists or minerals that are associated with gold frequently. Pyrite's a big one. Uh, galena is another one, which is a lead sulfide. Uh, very pretty uh, metal, mineral. Uh, you know, a number of different things. Quartz is another thing that's often associated with gold in some deposits. Uh, so really, you don't find a gold mineral per se, but you look for the things that are associated. And there's a huge variety of those. What about Platoro? Platoro is, a, yeah, that's a volcanic system, and that's volca the volcano itself is the structures related to the volcanic eruption, and the source is coming down from below, the fluids and so forth coming up along the sides, and also the heating of the surrounding rocks, which leached out some materials into the system. That's, that's the nutshell of my master's thesis. <laughs> yes, Patty? What about like the titanium? You hear, I know someone that has like a titanium jaw. Really? Is it wired up? They have to change the batteries in it too? You mean, like, have you that? Yeah, I have. Replacement. Yeah. Uh, I happen to know somebody in my family who has titanium screws in his hand oh. from where he broke his hand. Sledding. So where would they come from? Where would they find that? They would find it associated with these layered mafic intrusions. It's, it's another metal that's associated with the platinum group elements. Uh, where's titanium is right over here. See, it's in the same general area. So is it like mined 
Oh yeah, it's mined as a titanium. I mean, as, as a titanium ore. Still water, Montana. <laughs> That's about the only place in the world, well, the only place in the U.S. where they have platinum group elements and titanium. That's in mineable concentrations. What else, folks? Anything else? Benson, before we finish, if someone would like to come to the museum, could you tell us where it is and what the hours are? Well, the hours are... I have to be careful what I say because somebody involved with opening up the museum is in this room. Uh, but I won't quit looking at him while you'll blow his cover. Uh, but we do have, we're getting our museum docent staff together and we will have official hours posted soon. Uh, the Edward M. Ryan Geological Museum is located down in room 115, uh, down the hallway at Porter Hall. And we have about 5,000 world-class mineral and fossil specimens, which are just stunning. Uh, the mineralogy guys are getting horribly spoiled in there because they're getting beautiful captured zoo specimens as opposed to the real world specimens they'll see when they go out and do their own field mapping. You'd agree with that, right, Nick? Having been through mineralogy in there? It's a wonderful place. And uh, the docents are always more than willing to talk about what's in there. And besides, you know, all you guys who are students here, you can escape that other building or wherever you spend all your time. And you can go in there and hang out, and just, it's a different place. It's really neat. There's also fossils. Yeah, fossils and minerals. Uh, we have uh, Archaeopteryx there. We have all sorts of dinosaur teeth and replicas and so forth. Uh, we have lots of trilobites. We have lots of really cool looking things. Okay. Well, are there any further questions? Adams State College. Great stories begin here.